All right, here we go. All right, hi, welcome everybody. I'm Liz Fenton and I'm here with Lisa Steinke. She's my best friend of over 30 years and co-author of seven novels, How to Save a Life, uh, came out last week. It's a dark heart pounding love story with a Groundhog Day twist and it's available at Warwick's, uh, which we're so excited to partner with. Uh, Julie, why don't you tell us a little bit more? Okay, perfect. Well, thank you, Liz and Lisa, and thank you for the couch surfing book tour. It's been really fun. Um, we were just talking about it earlier that we started this pretty much right at the beginning of the shutdown. And so we've hosted a lot of great authors on this. So it's really nice to have you, Helena, be part of the couch surfing book tour. So thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I see most people that are here already have heard this before, but I have to do it just for the sake of us being recorded and who knows who's going to watch this. Um, Warwick's is located in La Jolla, San Diego, California. We are actually open for business, so if you want to come and browse books, you could do that. Social distancing, masks, um, any way you can get a book, you can get it from Warwick. So you can come to the store, you can call us, you can order it online pick it up at the store. We'll ship it to you. If you live in La Jolla, we'll drive it to your store, to your house. <laughs> so that's pretty much service. any that's service, man. <laughs> and I think if you live in La Jolla, if you spend a certain amount, we do, we actually will deliver for free. So um, we're going to, so I'll be putting in Helena's book, like Liz said, I'll be putting Helena's book and um, Liz and Lisa's books into the comment field. So um, I always like to say, if you're watching this, make sure you're ordering somebody's book. So anyways, with that, you guys have a great conversation. <laughs> Great. Well, Helena, we're so excited to have you here today. And I'm going to tell everybody a little bit about you. Um, Helena Dea Bala. Am I saying it right? Good. Yeah. Lisa gave me a phonetic spelling on, on my, on and my, then you sorry. Question me. I was like, I, listen. Well, I felt like I did it wrong. Anyway, <laughs> immigrated to the United States as a child to make ends meet during those difficult first years. She helped her mother clean houses on the weekends. She graduated Phi Beta Kappa from George Washington University and worked to become a lawyer and lobbyist in Washington, DC. After her day job left her feeling disconnected and unfulfilled. She deferred her student loans, applied for a credit card, and gave herself one year. One year to just listen. Five years in, she now does Craig, Craigslist Confessional full-time. Her book, Craigslist Confessional, was published on July 7th. Welcome, Helena. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> well, we're excited, too. So I'm going to hand you over to Lisa for all the hard-hitting questions that she Yes, as she I'm told sure you, she, yes, I'm sure you've never heard life. any of these questions before. Mm -hmm. They're all going to be like, what are these questions? <laughs> um, okay. The New York Times calls Craigslist confessional touching, and Publishers Weekly calls it an auspicious debut. It's described as a collection of raw, urgent, and heartfelt stories shared in honest anonymously. Will you tell us about your lunch with Joe and how the idea for this book was formed? Uh, so Joe, I worked on, if you know anything about Washington, D.C., it's a grid city. So I worked on 13th and G, which is just a few blocks, a couple of blocks away from the White House. And you can see the White House office buildings from my former office building. So just that location alone for my parents, first generation immigrants, I came here when I was 12, was like, you know, oh, she's, she's made it. What else could we want, you know? And they came to visit me there. They were so proud, took photos in front of the building. It was such a production, you know? And I found myself there and extremely unhappy with the job that I had, with the work that I was doing. It wasn't what I thought I'd be doing with my life. I'd gone to law school because I wanted to practice human rights law. I'd worked for civil rights organizations my whole career through law school. And then as often happens with people who have these high aspirations for, for you know, what they'll do after law school, they find that the student loan burden is so big that they can't really do any of these, you know, good quote unquote jobs. They have to, you know, work uh, in careers that are very punishing and, and the hours are awful. So that's where I was. And Joe was a homeless man who panhandled in front of said building. And um, I used to go to Capitol Hill all the time for work. And the way that they get lobbyists to get to go on the hill is they offer box lunches. So these really nice 
sandwich, chips, drinks, etc. And I always used to kind of sneak a few and take them to Joe and give them to him and, and go. And so that, that was kind of the relationship that we had. And then one day I didn't do that. I didn't have anything. And I just kind of walked into the building and he called after me. And um, basically I realized that he was relying on me for food and that I had almost callously overlooked that, you know, important detail in his life, which is that he needed to eat. And so I sat down and we had a conversation that day and I just kind of asked him about his life and what, what how he'd ended up homeless and did he have any family, just kind of questions that I'd been thinking about for a long time, but I'd never actually stopped to have a conversation with him, to acknowledge him. And once I did, I found that it was a little bit, it was two-sided. You know, we started talking to one another and I shared a bunch of things that I'd never shared before. I told him a bunch of things that felt a little bit awkward to confess to a complete stranger on, you know, on the street uh, while sitting on the street and eating a sandwich. But it felt, um, I don't know, it kind of felt, it felt good. I didn't want to interrogate it. I didn't want to question what was happening. It just felt like a natural connection that we had. And so that conversation ended and I went back to work and it, it stuck with me, this idea of, this is really strange. Why is it that I've had this really deep conversation with a total stranger on a street corner? Um, and why am I not getting that from my relationships? Um, and that stuck with me, that feeling that I'd had and this questioning of like, why was it that with Joe it was so easy to have this conversation? And I started to think about how I could replicate that feeling. And I, that's when I posted the ad on Craigslist and it just said, tell me about yourself. And in the body it said, you know, anything that you'd like to share, I'll listen anonymously for free for as long as you like. Um, and the rest, as they say, you know, you know the rest. So, you know, people right. started re replying to the ad and I started setting up meetings and, and here we are. <laughs> Did you have any idea the huge response that you were going to get? I mean, you said you woke up the next day after putting the, um, putting the ad up and your just email box was overflowing. I had, I had not a single inkling that I was going to get any legitimate responses. I thought maybe because it was Craigslist, I'd get a couple of, you know, hecklers, people being like, this is not what the personal is for, or people just kind of like, you know, sending inappropriate stuff. But actually it wasn't any of that. It was people who were either were kind of questioning the whole situation being like, mm, this is new and interesting. Why are you doing this? Or people who actually didn't even question and were like, yeah, no, I want to do this. Like, how do we set up our meeting? Where do we go from here? And that was very surprising. I didn't think that it would, it would resonate so much, but it became clear from that first ad and then the subsequent ones that, oh, I've hit a nerve here. This is something that, that people need. Um, and then that's when that sense of responsibility to keep doing it came from. But, you know, once I set up my first meeting, it was immediately like, okay, wow, this is, this is life changing. For me, at least, this is life changing. How did you decide um, which people to meet with and, and who was your first in-person meeting? Well, I think initially, and I don't know if this was deliberate, but I responded to everybody who had asked or wanted to meet to any capacity and asked any questions or said, yeah, I want to do this. Uh, but my first meeting was with Sarah, whose story is in the book. And Sarah had been a heroin addict for 20 years or something to that tune. And she had children, two kids, and she just wanted to talk about where her addiction had started and her childhood, which had been really traumatic and everything that had happened uh, to her leading up to that point. And she'd been clean when we met. Um, and I often wonder why it was with Sarah that things clicked, that I felt safe to actually kind of cross that line from theory to practice. And there was something about the way our conversation, the way that she reached out, um, she mentioned her husband and she said something along the lines of, 
oh, my husband's going to think I've lost my mind that I'm doing this, but he's supportive and he's supportive of everything that I do. And I thought it was so, I don't know, there was something so human about that little detail about her husband and how he's going to think that he's, you know, she's lost her mind. Because I was thinking I'd lost my mind too. You know, like this is right. a perfectly normal reaction to answering an ad on Craigslist and going to tell somebody about your life story. Um, so she was the first person that I met and it was across the street from where I, where I worked on 13th and G there's a Starbucks there probably still is. And I sat outside. It was, I remember really hot that day. I was wearing a white dress. Um, and I remember just kind of sitting and nervously waiting for her to show up and thinking she's not going to show up, but she was actually late. And I only had very little time for, for lunch. So I was worried that, I would either not have enough time to listen to her and make her feel rushed or that um, I'd have to overstay my lunch break. And there were very clear rules of where I worked that that was not acceptable. So um, when she did show up, we ended up going to the park nearby where they actually have a ton of protests uh, there now. Um, so it's in the news a lot, but we, we sat in one of those tables and she told me about her story. At what point did you decide to quit your job? Because you mentioned you were on lunch and, and so you were still working um, at your job and trying to do this at the same time. So when did that happen when you said, okay, I'm just gonna focus on this full time? I had been listening and setting up meetings for a, for a while, a few months, I would say, when I decided to quit my job. And I think that what ended up happening was that I met with Sarah and then many, many people after her. And I realized quickly, okay, doing this during lunch hour is not going to work because it's 45 minutes on a good day. Uh, if somebody shows up late or I have a meeting or something, it's going to be less than that. I don't, people, I don't want people to feel that they're being rushed through this um, and that there's a, you know, deadline. Um, and so that the alarm is going to ring and I'm going to have to cut them off and say, bye, I have to go now. Um, so I said, okay, I, I'll do it after work. So I'm setting up meetings after work. And then that wasn't enough. So I started setting them up on the weekends. And then that slowly kind of started becoming a job in and of itself in that the time commitment was about equal to what I was spending at my nine to five, so to speak. Um, and then I realized that I was going to work with this feeling. I mean, I remember having conversations with my husband. He, he had a, a Honda CRV. Um, he was my boyfriend at the time and he would drop me off in front of the building and I just would be in tears before work because I just didn't want to go in. I was so miserable and so sad. And I kept saying, why do I have to do this? I have to go in, but I don't want to. And it just was clear that I was doing something that wasn't a job. I wasn't getting paid for, but it gave me so much purpose and so much happiness. And I, it gave my life meaning. And then I was spending so much of my time going to this job that made me totally feel worthless and sad and, made me question all of the decisions that had led me to take it, to take this job. And it became clear, like, there's, this is not the way that it's supposed to be, right? Your job is supposed to make you happy and make you feel fulfilled and make you feel that you have meaning. And then I started having conversations with Alex about, you know, I think that I want to quit my job and I want to do this full time. So we'd had a few conversations and I'd looked at like crunch the numbers, like made a financial plan and tried to see if, if I could swing even quitting my job at that point, which the answer, the long and short of it was absolutely not. Like I had no <laughs> savings, I had student loans. Like it was just, it, it was a bad idea any which way you would have turned it. But I, I just really wanted to do this. So I actually, the day after my birthday, my birthday is September 8th, the day after my birthday, my parents had shown up to surprise me. We'd gone to the office building, they'd look around, they'd taken set the photos that I mentioned earlier, they were so proud of me. And I got called into HR because at the last minute, they came to surprise me. I'd taken the day off. I'd squared off all of my work. I hadn't left any, you know, ends untied, loose ends, but it just was frowned upon to take time off. It was 
a huge no-no. Um, and it was my first time I'd even ever done it. And I'd been at the job almost a year. So I got a, I got a talking to, and mm -hmm. I was sitting in the office and the, the thought slowly creeped into my brain. Oh, this is when you are supposed to, you know, this is the perfect time. If you're ever going to do it, this is it. You, this is your open, you have an opportunity here. So the conversation, it was never like an abrupt, like, yeah, I'm quitting. But the conversation like slowly moved there and I didn't stop it. I didn't really try to guide it elsewhere. And at the end of it, it was clear. I was, you know, I said I was taking my, they gave me two weeks to reconsider, see if that's what I wanted to do. I said, all due respect, thank you, but I know what I want to do. And mm -hmm. so I took two weeks pay, which was all I got. And, um, and that was it. And then I walked home and I called Alex and I started crying and I said, I don't know what I've just done, but I did my <laughs> job, I did it and I, I'm panicking. Um, so it was very hard and I didn't think it was the right move when I actually did it. But then maybe like five years later, I was like, okay, maybe I did the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think we have a couple, I have more questions, but I think we have a couple questions from the yeah group, yeah so. we do you yeah. know that's a thing that's a thing with leaps of faith i mean they never feel right when you're doing them and maybe that's why you just have to have i mean every huge decision in any job i've quit earlier than i should it always it does it just feels exciting but scary you know all day like so many emotions mm -hmm. uh wrapped mm -hmm. up so we have some questions uh tess b is asking how many, uh, how many confessions did you listen to? And did you ever feel unsafe in any of the conversations that you had? So I've, I stopped counting after 300, but it's been over 300. Um, and no, I've never felt unsafe. I felt very uncomfortable. Um, there are things that people want to confess that are things that are difficult to hear. Um, as a listener, let alone to imagine being in this person's shoes and to have gone through what they went through. Uh, but I've never felt unsafe, even though the prospect of something possibly happening that was dangerous was very real, even in the very beginning, because the only thing that I knew about Craigslist, besides this is where you go and sell and, and find apartments, which is what people use in DC, was that movie, that Lifetime movie, the Craigslist. Mm -hmm. So yeah. my mom, huge, huge <laughs> Lifetime watcher, and I'd actually like seen and heard about it before. And so that was the one thing that I associated it with. And um, I remember Alex went to a couple of meetings. He shadowed me, didn't sit with me, obviously, but like just went to make sure yeah. that I met the person and everything was fine. Um, and I remember feeling this is a little bit, you know, I, but I made sure to be in a public space. So always a Starbucks or a big coffee shop, uh, and made sure that if there was anything about the interaction or the conversation, <laughs> Holly says, Oh my God, the Craigslist killer. <laughs> yeah. So that's exactly the type of kind of reaction that I had. It's like, you know, I could be meeting with somebody who wants to use this for purposes other than what I've posted about. Um, and so it was a little bit, a little bit daunting, but I've been so lucky in that every single person that I've met with has been very respectful um, and has definitely wanted to use that time that we had together for what the ad, for the purposes of the ad. Yeah, it, uh, that's really interesting. And, and Holly has a question, which I think is a good follow-up question. Uh, how do you, how do you cope with the weight of these stories each day? Yeah, um, so I had no idea what I was walking into when I started doing this. Um, I didn't really, I didn't really expect for people to go so deep so soon. And it's it's a huge responsibility, I think, to the person that I that you meet with, that I was meeting with, the people I was meeting with, to make sure that I was as um, welcoming and empathetic and um, non-judgmental listener as possible. And I went into this, into the very first meeting even, 
with that perspective, with those goals. Uh, and I think those have served me well throughout the duration of the project. But that said, even with the best intentions and the best preparation and the best stealing of the heart to listen to things that are definitely going to be difficult, you find that there's no way to prepare yourself for what you actually hear. And I think the more you try, the it, it completely defeats the purpose of listening and of doing this, something like this, of this project. So you have to go in completely open and raw and accept the fact that you're probably going to break down and cry um, and, and that you don't want to put that emotional weight on the person who's telling the story. So you just need to kind of like pull it together and process afterwards. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that has become much harder since I had my son because time has gone from, you know, unlimited to just basically like half an hour at the end of the day. Um, so I process during the only time that I have that's my own, which is oftentimes, you know, in the morning when I'm brushing my teeth, when I'm taking a shower, just whatever me time I have is when I'm starting and thinking through everything and trying to make sure that I'm in an okay emotional place after having heard the stories. But to answer your question, it's hard and I'm not very good at it yet. And I don't think I ever will be. And I think that being good at it probably is a disservice to a project like this and to, to being a listener. So right. you get hurt and you try to do the best. Are you ever like in your regular life, can you just talk to somebody else? <laughs> I can't hear this right now. I feel like I would just be so full of like, you can't do that because you're right. like I'm the listener now. Like everybody right. knows. This is now like, everyone's coming to you. They're like, listen, I didn't put anything on Craigslist, but I just have something I need right. to talk to you about. You're like, oh, what am I, I going to do with this? <laughs> I was always kind of that. I was always yeah. that person in, in my relationships. So I don't think anything really changed when I started right. doing it. I think I was that friend. I was always that friend. But, you know. I, I love when people come to me and, you know, they just want to unload and be heard. I think that's okay. Yeah. And so I, I don't ever <laughs> turn anybody away, but I think I have moments where I'm like very full and mm -hmm. I just need somebody to listen to me for a change. And it's right. always disgruntling when you find that there isn't anybody around. You kind of look around and hmm. Okay. I know who I'm calling next time I have a, I'm mad at Lisa, I'm going to call you. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> we can each just call, start calling her. And you're mad at me, you can call her. And tell her this everything. Is true. I'm happy to this be. This is true. I'm happy. Um, I'm, I don't know about where I am in your screen, but I'm. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you, back to when you quit your job. So you, you quit. And you had, you said you had no business quitting. What was your plan? I mean, did you, were you thinking, okay, I've got to think of a way to monetize this? Or were you just like, I'm just going to do this and figure it out later? Yeah. So I, I didn't have a plan, which whenever I think of, I, whenever I hear myself say that out loud right now, I always feel a little bit like defensive about it because my, I have a voice in my head that says, well, you should because it's not like a smart person thing to do is to quit your job and like not have a backup plan, right? Like, how are you going to live? But my plan was I was going to defer my student loans, which is what I did. I started a credit card, which again, not the best move. Um, and I had like this little savings. And so I was going to live off of that for a year. <laughs> so mm -hmm. of course, immediately that all went out the window and it became very difficult, but I didn't think about monetizing because I thought I had a feeling, a sickly feeling that that would dilute the heart mm -hmm. of this, figuring out mm -hmm. like, Oh, how am I going to make money from this? No, I didn't. That felt right. dirty. I didn't want to do that. And I didn't want to pass. I definitely didn't want to pass the cost of this to the people who were reaching out to me. So I knew that that had to be entirely free and that I had to keep doing that intact because I'm not a therapist. The service that I provide is not therapy. It's, it's never claimed to be and I don't want it to be therapy. So I can't in good conscience charge to listen to people. So I knew that that wasn't gonna be a choice. 
And that's as far as I thought about it is I want it to be free. I can charge people to listen to them. I have a little bit of money and I have a credit card. I'm going to do this for a year. And if the answer comes to me at the end of the year, how I'm going to keep doing it and how I'm going to finance it, even if it's something that I have to like take out a loan for or something, then I'll think about it then and I'll deal with it then. But for now, I just really want to like see where this goes and give it some space and breathing room to grow, which I think in retrospect, when you over plan and you try to do too much and figure out everything all at once, you can get so overwhelmed that it just feels ugh, like you don't even want to get started to begin with. So I'm glad I didn't. Um, but I mean, again, I had no security blanket, no idea what I was going to do. Uh, when I did quit my job, I realized that something that I wanted to do for sure was I was having these important conversations with people and people kept saying, not this every single time, but a, a version of, you know, I'm glad that what I'm going through might help somebody else, or I hope that what I've been through might help somebody else. And that over repeated over and over again is what gave me the idea of, okay, so we need to find, I need to find a way to connect these people to find kindred spirits. Right? So, somebody's having trouble with um, parenting or miscarriage or something, and then there's somebody else going through something that's similar, having these two souls meet will make help both of them, will help one feel that sharing her story has helped somebody else and will help the other feel, okay, somebody else has been through this, I'm not alone, I can get through it. And that's when I started asking for permission to take notes. Um, but it was two years before anything came of those notes, before I found a place to publish them. Um, and I felt that it was something that I needed to keep my kind of promise and make sure that I found a story, a place to publish these stories. But it was a long process. I mean, I have no background in writing. I'm not a writer. I went to law school. So at the end of the day, you know, this was like learning from negative negative 10 mm -hmm. not even from, from zero right so it took a long time but i got it there so you had what there's 40 stories in the book right correct how did you decide i mean you said you've had a ton of conversations at this point how did you decide which ones to put in that was probably one of the hardest parts of putting the book together um, I feel very strongly and very personally invested in every single story that I've heard. Uh, I root for every person that I've spoken to. I want things to work out for everyone. Unfortunately, that's not the reality of life. You know, not everybody has a happy ending. Not every story in this book has one either. Um, and I think that's just trying to be true to people's lives and what has happened. Um, picking between stories to include and having to exclude others was really just um, a process of trying to add as many and include as many diverse topics, ideas, peoples, and voices in the book as possible. Um, so we tried to cast the wide net and capture and put the spotlight on as many topics as possible. I can't claim that we did the best that I did the best job at doing that with such limited space and with 40 stories to tell, it was very hard to have to pick, but we came at it from a place of wanting to include diverse voices. So I hope that we've accomplished that. But I mean, I, I would have another 80 books, hopefully <laughs> where we can right. do that for everyone else and include as many stories as possible. Yeah, I was going to say, maybe there'll be another book and then another book, right? Because you can never stop filling these. But I imagine that conversation, you said we, so it's like you, you get a publisher, so then it's not just up to you. So then everybody's got to kind of go through them. And obviously, they're going to defer to you, I think. But there's more cooks in the kitchen at that point to try to decide. But they do. it does seem very diverse. It seems like you have a good balance of everything. To me, I don't know what you've pulled from, but as somebody that doesn't know that and has read through this book, it feels that way. So I think you accomplished it personally. I mean, and Liz you, you does both too. know that it's not mm -hmm. just about, you know, what you want. It's, right. Like you said, there's 
very many cooks in the kitchens. There's a lot mm -hmm. of people weighing in. And I was very lucky to work with an editor who was just absolutely brilliant and absolutely got the heart of the book. And so it was very much so a conversation between the two of us about, okay, which stories touch on this, which touch on that. So just to kind of make a, put together a spherical book is really what we were seeking to do. But that mm -hmm. said, you know, I, I can think of like a few stories that for her were just a, an absolute pass. And for me, it was like, oh, really? Are you sure? Uh, you right. Definitely a conversation. Uh, well, right, because you're connected to all of them in a really personal way. And she's yeah. like, nah, nah. You know, you can see how she wouldn't have the, and maybe that's a good thing sometimes to have somebody come in who doesn't have that. You know, that's what editing is. I mean, for us, even writing fiction, you know, our editor will come in and say, oh no, you've got it. Because they're looking at it with fresh eyes and, right. um, you know, a fresh perspective, which can really help as well. well Have I think, there been, oh, go yeah. ahead. No, no, please, please go. Uh, I was just gonna ask if um, you've kept in touch with anybody or, or kind of just got the story and then decided to go separate ways or how does that all work? So the, the initial idea behind posting this ad was I wanted to keep it as anonymous as possible. So it's on Craigslist because what Craigslist does is it scrambles emails. So you don't even have this person's real email address. You have the name that they give you, but it, it alias is welcome, you know, it was also part of the ad. So if they don't want to use their real name, there's no way for you to go and confirm has this person given me, you know, legitimate. And if you're meeting them in person, literally the only thing you know is what they look like. Um, right. So it's very like disconnected. You're meeting a total stranger at a coffee shop and talking to them about their deepest secrets. Uh, ultimately, sorry, redirect me. What was the original question? Cause I feel like I got uh, on a tangent. No, it's okay. You know, you're, you're getting, get who do you keep in touch with anybody or was it more like, oh. Hey, I'm going to collect this story and then you can go your way and I'm going to go mine or, I, I realized what I was saying. So I yeah. think that because it was meant to be a one-time conversation, just as anonymous as possible, I did not set an expectation at all in the beginning of a conversation that we would have an ongoing relationship. Um, and it was never something that I sensed people wanting who were reaching out to me as part of the ad. I didn't sense that what they wanted was a friend or a therapist or somebody to weigh in on their lives. I think that they wanted to use the ad for exactly what it said, this total vent session, no holds barred, I'm gonna tell you everything, and then, you know, go their own separate ways. That said, I think that there were a few people who signaled that they wanted to kind of keep talking. And if that was ever the case, I never said, no, we're not, I don't want to or anything. I always kept the door wide open, gave them my phone number and my email address so that they could be in touch mm -hmm. whenever they wanted, if they ever wanted. Uh, there are four people and three of them are in this book with whom I have ongoing friendships with. Uh, one of them is Henry, one of them is Edie, uh, the other one is also, so there's, I would say four, but so they are friends of mine. They've become friends now. Henry and Edie especially are people that I have very special friendships with. Um, and I think it's because I've seen them both. Uh, Henry, I met only months after he had lost his wife. Um, and Edie, I met kind of at the end of a chapter of her life when she was doing, she was looking back and at everything that she'd accomplished and just kind of wondering about what to do next. And I think they were both such special um, times in both of their lives that they wanted to keep that conversation going. And we really connected. We connected in a way that I don't really know how to describe. I don't know how you go, you go on to become really good friends with a stranger you've met from Christ. Right. But it, it happened in both of those cases. And both of them are older. Henry is in his, uh, I want to say my dad's age, so in his 70s. Was he the one on the CBS yeah. interview? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He seems yeah. really sweet. He's he's the he's best. So sweet. He is a very special person <clears throat> and he's a lovely human being. Um, and mm. um, I, I'm very lucky that we have 
we've become friends. Uh, there's a story there that I don't have a chance to tell very often, but so um, in 2017, Henry moved back to, uh, to New Orleans, which is where he was born and raised um, from DC, which is where I met him, which is where he answered the ad. Um, and in 2017, Alex and I had moved to, to New York City and I was feeling very sad and very alone and alienated because he was at work all the time and I was still a listener. And um, he, we had kept in touch for the last two years. And he wrote me this email when I was on the phone with one of my best friends. And he said, uh, he signed off with, so when are y'all coming to New Orleans? Which is how he'd signed off basically every email since he'd moved to New Orleans. And um, I was on the, friend, uh, on the phone with my friend and we were talking about how we hadn't seen each other in, in years and felt like years. And I say, do you want to go to New Orleans with me? And he's like, sure. <laughs> so long story short, and I'm cutting off a lot of extraneous details, but we go during Easter to visit Henry in New Orleans and we stay with him for a week. I think maybe even a little bit longer than a week. And we had the best time with him, just the absolute best time with him. And at the very end, we promised that we would go back again and visit every Easter and kind of make it a tradition. So we have gone back to visit Henry in New Orleans three times now, and we were meant to go again um, this year, except for right, me. But, yeah. And um, last year we went with Ronan, my son, who was nine months at the time, and my husband um, and my best friend. So we went as a whole family and stayed with him in his apartment. And um, we're very, I'm very lucky to say we're very good friends and I'm very lucky to have kept in touch with him throughout all these years but yeah Henry I met through Craigslist. <laughs> that's amazing I'm getting chills that's amazing I mean just the most unlikely friendship right you would never you pass people on the street all the time and like yeah. it's just like that just someone plucked, plucked from obscurity is now like if someone you're spending yeah. Easter's with your family which yeah. is amazing. I think um, so cool. the older you get you just kind of make friends with people that are in that social circle or people that you right. talk for, people who are similar to you in some way. And it's amazing to see how you can find friendship with somebody that is opposite to you in, in right. the most ways you can think of. And yet he's, I would say, one of my one of my best friends. He's such a <laughs> sweet man. I love him. Yeah. So amazing. Sorry, it's just so cute. Like, And it's probably so good for him. I mean, yeah. after all well, he's been through. He loves, um, so his son lives kind of far away from him. And uh, when he met Ronan last year, we went out to dinner and Ronan was sitting on his dad's lap, on Alex's lap, and dad, Alex was sitting right next to Henry. And Henry who had wanted to give him his space, was trying not to be overbearing and like wanted to be cutesy. Um, mm -hmm. Ronan just turns to him at one point and he just reaches out his hands and he goes and he sits on Henry's lap and there I have these photos of them they're so cute and just that moment it all became clear like wow we've come a long way that's so. amazing you must have like that in moments like that you must think back on like bawling like when you know your husband your then boyfriend's dropping you off at work I know that feeling and I have been at that job um yeah. and now you're and then you're sitting with Henry with your child thinking, um, okay, like this is how life's supposed to be. Yes, that's exactly it. That's exactly right. it. I had this moment of clarity where it's like, this is all just for this alone. Totally right. worth it. Totally worth it. Just to have met this person I would have never met otherwise. To have this relationship with him, to have my son sit on his lap in New Orleans is just an amazing experience. How life can just take you mm -hmm. one little tiny decision right down this wonderful road I, I was wondering if Lisa was thinking about her job when you were talking oh, girl, about I, your, was. I, didn't, I didn't want to interrupt but I was like oh, I had like I, a I, similar it was weird I had like a similar kind of thing happen with my job and just kind of deciding to quit just just deciding one day you know it's just like one of those same kind of things so I can relate um to that for sure isn't there any there, there's probably nothing worse than feeling that you're spending a huge chunk of the major the majority of your waking mm -hmm. hours putting in time and effort and 
everything into a job that feels like it does it gives nothing back yes not only to you but it gives nothing back to the world because if right? it's meaningful in some way then absolutely do it it's worth doing it even if it's right not. but when right. you don't feel that you're doing anything that's worth something that's I think what what did it for me is that I didn't feel that I was doing anything important for somebody else right so. and that's the whole reason you went into law and you were trying to do that and it just didn't yeah. go that way and so that was it sounds like that was just in your nature that's what you were going to do somehow so you found it just yeah crazy. exactly I gravitated towards yeah. something that made me feel like it was you know that I was giving back and I was doing something for right. somebody else um, so Helena, tell everybody, because we're going to start wrapping up, tell everybody how they can find you on social media and your uh, website. So you can go to craigslistconfessional.com where you can find some stories that I've listened to, links to about every single interview I've done for the last five years. Um, and I am at Helena Diabala on Instagram. So there's lots of photos of uh, Alex and our dog and me occasionally and maybe a few things about the book <laughs> <laughs> sounds Love like our it. instagram yeah mm -hmm. um well you guys you can find us at lisa and liz on instagram and liz fenton and lisa stanky on facebook we do a lot of giveaways over there and our website where you can find all the links is uh, liz and lisa.com julie i'm gonna hand it over to you okay and thank you. That was a great conversation, Helena. We're so happy that you were here with us. I mean, we could have gone on and on. I'm sure there's stories for like days that we could talk about. So oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Julie, my husband wants me to tell you he went to UCSD and he used to go to Warwick's all the time. It's <gasps> a favorite. It's Yay. a good haunt. <laughs> yeah, Warwick's, I mean, we're 1896 and um, we've been in La Jolla since the 30s and the building that we're in since the 50s. And so we have generational um, yeah. connections to people. So it's a pretty special place. So tell them thank you for supporting us. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, so yeah, so uh, links are in the um, chat to order the book. And um, we're going to be posting this on both Facebook and YouTube channels. So I'm going to talk to that too, in case anybody gets this far on it. Um, follow Warwick's as well. And if you want to know any more about events coming up, there'll be Liz and Lisa have it on their website for couch surfing. Warwick's has some other virtual events. So follow us um, there and um, join our email list and you'll get email notifications. So again, thank you everybody. This was a really good conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Helena, thank, thank you so thank much. You so it was much. such a pleasure. All right, oh, did guys. we show, did you guys show the book cover? Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. I'll show it again now. Yeah, let's, let's oh, see. Times three. Wait, four. Uh, I got mine on my phone. Uh, four. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's, it's a great, it's, it was a great It's cover. a great book. Yeah, it definitely was, pick yeah. this one up, guys. It's awesome. So, all right, we'll see you guys next week. Bye, Bye. Thank you so much. Okay, bye.